Hello! If you have been following the channel, you know that we have just unboxed a Soviet space clock from a Soyuz spacecraft. From this control panel on the left, which flew from 1996 to 2002 in the Soyuz TM spacecraft. Of course we proceeded to take it apart right away. To our surprise, we found an incredibly beautiful assembly inside. It was way more complex than we'd ever have thought. Quite daunting in fact, with its unexplainable complexity, chock full of Soviet bloc circuits that were unfamiliar to us. So much so that Master Ken, our reverse engineer extraordinaire, was initially reticent to work on this. Okay, I don't think I'll be reverse engineering this one. What? Well, that's, that's, that's your work? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> it's got like mystery ICs in many of them. Yes, so it has your name on it. So Comrade Ken is back with the Soviet clock. So I've been going through some analysis and making some notes and figuring out how the, the clock works. And you, so you, you feel like you're a spy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Re Reverse engineering good Soviet secrets here. So what have you found? So I've pretty much figured out the power supply, which is a rather complicated switching power supply. I figured out how the display part works and now I'm working backwards to figure out how the how the clock circuitry works. Uh -huh. the, the switching power supply is a lot more complicated than you would expect from a switching power supply. Basically it's taking probably 24 volts input through this connector and then producing two 5 volt outputs, one for the chips and then one for the LED display. Okay, and it's a switch power supply. Yeah, which yeah. makes it efficient. Yeah. So this is about half of the power supply here. Uh -huh. Um, th this is the control circuitry, and then here is the f output for the 5 volts, which is a fairly standard forward converter on the output side, except they have two outputs in parallel, which is a little unusual. Why? Well, must ah, that's uh, interesting. So it's maybe some redundancy well, of well, some I th kind? I think the idea is to give isolation between the power supply for the chips and the power supply for the LED. I've noticed that there's very few um, decoupling capacitors on these boards. Huh. Um, usually, you know, modern or yeah. relatively modern TTL would have like one decoupling capacitor for each chip. That's true. Each board has like maybe three decoupling capacitors, mm -hmm. which is more than the Paul Guidance computer where they didn't believe in decoupling capacitors at all. So. Mm -hmm. I have always been impressed at Ken's uncanny ability to untangle unknown pieces of electronics. Gosh, he is able to reverse engineer entire ICs from die pictures. This is no exception, and although he apologized for his schematic doodles, it was mesmerizing to look at his work process, putting pieces together bit by bit. So the power supply is these two boards here. Um, we start with 24 volts coming in from the connector which goes to the second board. The second board has this interesting pink integrated circuit, which is a fairly standard voltage regular integrated circuit. It's um, producing um, 15 volt output. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of filter capacitors and filter inductors. There's lots of filtering, right? I expect a lot of this is to prevent noise from the switching power supply from feeding back into the rest of the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So now the, the 15 volts from here goes to the first board, which is where all the action happens. Mm -hmm. now, this big trans transistor in the middle is the power transistor that chops the, the 24 volt input. And then that goes to a transformer and then two output filters and some, some um, diodes. These orange rectangles are diodes. Huh. And, it's, and that part is basically a, st a fairly standard forward converter switching power supply. So, so the 24 volts gets chopped and we have two 5 volt outputs, one for the integrated circuits and then one for the LED display. Mm -hmm. Probably to prevent noise from LED switching going into the, mm -hmm. into the chips. Um, now that, the 15 volt power supply, that's used for the control circuitry, which is rather complicated. Um, first, the 15 volts goes to an inverter. There's a, a chip here with four transistors that basically is an oscillator. 15 volts goes in and you get 
um, 15 volt peak to um, plus and minus AC coming out, which gets rectified by the rectifier bridge rectifiers here. So you get plus and minus 15 volts for the op amps. So the, these um, round chips here are op amps. Uh -huh. And th these are what um, look at the output voltage, compare it to a reference generated by the Zener diode. This rather large Zener diode here. Oh, that's a huge guy. That's a Zener? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, I nine, can see nine volt it. Zener. Yeah, yeah, I can see the package. Yeah. yeah. And so then the, the op amps um, give you pulse width modulation of your oscillations so that if you want more voltage, the pulses get wider, less voltage, pulses get narrower. Okay. Basically, standard switching power supply. And then that um, drives a transistor here. Uh huh which then sends pulses through an isolation transformer because they didn't have opto-isolators then, mm -hmm. which is then prov provides the drive signal for the big transistor. Okay. Now, you might wonder why they do all this instead of just using a simple um, buck converter. And the reason is that um, this gives you isolation between the power coming in and the circuitry. Mm -hmm. So there's no actual electrical connection. Um, you know, this is what you do in your, your cell phone charger because you want to be protected from the AC voltage. Mm -hmm. um, usually with, you know, 24 volts coming in, you don't need any isolation. For instance, the Apollo guidance computer didn't, didn't isolate, but for mm -hmm. some reason they wanted to, to have electrical isolation between the circuitry and the incoming power. Comrade, this is good design practice. All right. And then it goes to a whole bunch of chips that uh, yeah, you know what the chips are now but we haven't completely do, do reversed engineered. Do you want me to walk you through a bit of that? Sure. So we have 10 LEDs here for 10 digits of display. Mm -hmm. um, most LED drivers use multiplexing where one chip drives one, one digit at a time and you just cycle through it very right, fast. Right. Instead they use 10 of these um, seven segment driver chips there's eight here and then two on the other Beneath, underside. Yeah. And then there's a whole pile of resistors on the other side, one for each segment. Wow. So this, the circuitry is basically driving the LED display. Mm -hmm. um, so these drivers are then connected to these two boards, which provide the, the time on the top here. Mm -hmm. And then these two boards, which provide the stopwatch on the bottom here. So those are counters mostly? So it's a combination of um, four bit counter chips, um, simple TTL counters. Um, you have decimal counters for decimal digits and then some binary counters as well. And then there's a bunch of um, NOR gates, or sorry, NAND gates and and or invert circuits to reset when it hits 60 uh -huh. because your regular counters don't reset at 60 okay. like you need to do for seconds and minutes. And then these are isolation transformers, um, basically the equivalent of opto isolators for signals that um, come in and out from the, the connector. And that, that's either to drive something or to reset the clock to So uh, I'm, right. I'm still working that part out. Right. Um, and then here you have the crystal that, that drives the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a high frequency crystal and then there's um, counters to divide it down to a, mm -hmm. until you get down to seconds. And then another interesting thing here is a, a relay. Mm -hmm. And so that provides isolated mm -hmm. connection here to mm -hmm. trigger when something happens. So presumably when a counter goes to zero, the relay will close, that will signal externally and your, your engine oh, oh, will shut off or something. You can play with that. And it, it, it's conformal coded, so how do you, uh, how do you probe it? So, so, so the conformal coding um, provides a problem. I've been using um, probes with pins on the end so I can po poke through the conformal coding with the pin. Uh -huh. Also, the conformal coding isn't on the top of the wiring harnesses or the underside of the ICs, uh -huh. so I, I can get some access without having to go through the conformal coding. So, so far we haven't had to disassemble it more than this at this point. So the integrated circuits, most of these are metal lid um, surface mount. These are TTL chips, similar to the 7400 series, um, but um, Russian versions, all labeled in, in Cyrillic with some Greek letters thrown in for confusion. 
Um, th these ones have like pink plastic packages, which are kind of unusual. I saw somebody say it was beryllium, but I don't know if I can trust the comments. I would not believe it's beryllium. <laughs> I've never seen pink beryllium. <laughs> Um, but even so, I'm not going to like taste the chips. Purple, actually, I, I have old circuits that are in purple ceramic from from the U.S. So well, well th this looks like plastic rather than ceramic. Oh, 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 oh. okay. So, so okay. you can see there have been some some wires added for external powering. Mm -hmm. So, so these two wires were added to the five volt output for the chip. Uh -huh. um, these two wires are wired right across the power transistor, which doesn't make any sense. Uh -huh. um, my suspicion is that the previous wires were added, powered up the chips, but the display didn't wire, light up because the LED side of the power supply was not being powered. Uh -huh. And then these wires were put in the wrong place. Um, and so it probably never got working. Oh, but I hope they didn't zap the transistor though. Um, no, it should be okay. Oh, figure I mean, out pretty the, soon. The, the transistor would normally have 24 volts across it, so putting 5 volts across it would okay. should be okay. Do, do you have the connector yet? From um, I've model? ordered a connector from Bulgaria or Romania or somewhere. It should be here in January. Okay, so maybe we we'll power it then. And then I want to remove those ugly wires. So there, there's, need them, right? th there's th three sets of, of wires here. There's the the aftermarket wires, mm -hmm. um, there's the budge wires that were added to add some components to the feedback loop. So probably the the, the pulse width modulation wasn't working quite right. Mm -hmm. Then there's these black wires that go from the power transistor pins to the circuit board. Okay. So these are basically just how the transistor was mounted into the circuit. So those are normal ones. And so the original wiring has conformal coating over it, and the additional wiring d does not. Okay. So you can distinguish it. All right, well, we'll get rid of the bad ones. The wiring harnesses are very nice. They are super good. They are beautiful. But they're, they're a real pain to figure out what's connected to what. <laughs> this is to prevent the reverse engineering of beautiful Soviet so, clock. So I'm about halfway Come through around. tracing out all the wiring. In the meantime, Ken has figured out most of the digital part and posted his first article about the clock, which I link in the description section. So we should soon be able to try to power the clock and figure out if the previous attempt at powering it through the wrong wires did not try the whole thing. We have faith in good, reliable Russian hardware, so hopefully we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>